What's up, everybody? Sean here with another live Live to Roll. This week, we got an awesome topic, talking to my buddy Simon here uh, about writing children's books and just kind of what all that stuff's about and all kinds of different cool quad stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, so let's just get right into it. I'm Sean, C5, C6 quad from a snowboarding accident um, 17 and a half years ago. Tom, in studio. Yeah, what's up, everybody? Um, I'm over here uh, hanging out with Sean today um, in the studio uh, over at Rancho. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm Tom Conway, C5, C6 quad as well. Um, live here in Southern California. And uh, yeah, we'll toss that over to Bobby. What's up, everyone? Good to be back. My name is Bobby Rohan, straight out of Huntington Beach, California. <laughs> and I'm a C56 quadriplegic, 32 years. Now, my crib is starting to finally look somewhat normal, but I don't got the fancy lights like, uh, like Sean does. So you're going to have to hook me up, Sean, and I can get some fancy lights over there. So we'll let's you. move it over to our guest, Simon. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Simon Kalkovecchia. I'm a children's book author, motivational speaker, and disability awareness advocate. I broke my neck at 19 playing rugby in Australia, just for a quick summary of that, and been about half my life using a wheelchair. I have C56 quadriplegia. Yeah, man. Thanks. I too. I totally forgot that you were uh, injured playing like actual rugby, like European rugby. Yeah, I, I remember know. hearing that too. That's 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 cool. And I actually yeah, met I'm... Simon at first playing quad rugby. Just so everybody, yeah, we were uh, the first time I met him years back. So <laughs> yeah, it was super cool, and it, it it is pretty wild to be to get injured playing rugby, and then I didn't actually play until about ten or fifteen years later where I started playing wheelchair rugby and to be able to get back to the game that I love in a different way. Like it was pretty incredible to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Man. I, big question, uh, Simon, with that, you know, I, I came back, I came from a swimming and cycling background and everyone's like, Oh, you got to get back in the pool. You got to go hand cycling. Let's go, let's go. And you know, it was a little bit, you know, it just didn't feel the same. So I didn't, pursue it. I don't like to hand yeah. cycle. I'd rather just go push it in my wheelchair. What, yeah. I mean, even though the game is a lot different than our regular rugby, yeah. I mean, it, was it just, you know, like, oh man, even though it, this is called rugby, it's different. So it doesn't feel like that same what you were doing beforehand. What is that? What it was that like? The, the, the wheel, wheelchair rugby has the same energy of rugby where you, you're getting out there, you're smashing people, the camaraderie of the teammates it just felt good and it felt like a similar passion compared to running on the field obviously yes there's a whole lot of different things about it but the core of it the physical violence that we create <laughs> on the court and the camaraderie with the teammates is what really brings it home and makes it feel like rugby nice well put man yeah that's good that's great um all right so let's get into some of these uh some of the uh our, our actual topic so your book's called frank and mustard which is about a, you can give a little bit more uh about the characters but i know your one of your main characters is a disabled dog who's in a wheelchair yep. correct uh you want to just explain a little bit on like how you kind of came up with the idea and uh how how it got started yeah, it was the inspiration. Yeah, so give you a little bit of backstory here. I had been I I'd been searching for purpose in my life and like went through battles of depression where I didn't feel like I had anything going on in my life. And one of the ways I decided to conquer that was by volunteering in schools and hanging out with kids and I really enjoyed being able to spend time with kids and just have that connection with them. And uh, I had spent about 10 years volunteering with kids. And during that whole time, I never once saw a book in the classroom that had a character using a wheelchair. And I'm sure that bothers you just as much as it bothered me. And yep. I thankfully ended up 
meeting one of my good friends. His name's Arturo Alvarez, and he's the illustrator of the children's book series that we created, The Adventures of Frank and Mustard. And we became best friends two years before I even knew he could be an illustrator for the, a dream that I had been thinking about while I was volunteering with kids. And when we connected, it was, it just, it just everything lined up and we just went for it. We both believed in the idea. We're both creators and passionate about art and working together as a team on projects. That's how we met. And it just came together so naturally. And I just really love his artistic style. And we went for it. And I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and to tell you more about the characters, yes, uh, the how I was inspired to create Frank and Mustard was by uh, thinking about, okay, I want to connect with kids. Well, what's a good way to do that? Well, I feel like talking to animals are usually pretty awesome when kids are reading books. Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to be an animal in these books, what animal would best represent me? Then I immediately thought of a wiener dog because they most commonly use a wheelchair in the real life. And if I'm going to be a wiener dog, well, then I got to make a hot dog joke. <laughs> so I created Frank and his best buddy is a little yellow bird that rides on his, uh, on the back, on a saddle, like a squirt of mustard. <laughs> and that's how it began. That's awesome, man. Uh, that's cool, dude. Those are cool little characters, man. Uh, and yeah, your first book, I remember it was uh, Stuck in the Mud, right? The first story. So it was yeah, about, you know, his, his wheel getting stuck in the mud. Which, oh, yeah. Based you know... on a true story <laughs> from my life where I was out at a park. I was actually up in Vancouver. I don't know if you were in Vancouver for the wheelchair rugby tournament that we used to do up there. But nah. when I was coming back from Vancouver, BC, I wanted to go to this park and – it was a wet, rainy day, but I wanted to see the park, and I went out and had a great time there, but I ended up getting stuck in the mud. It was bad. There was, like, these tracks on top, uh, underneath the mud that got wound up on my bolt that is for my easy lock in my wheelchair van, and I was so stuck in there, like, one person couldn't free me from it, so we had to get the staff at the park and – they came out and they eventually got me out of the mud, but I was stuck there for, you know, a good hour in the rain. And thankfully I have a good sense of humor. So I just laughed about it, but it's actually been a great story to tell in that I like to talk to kids about how we might not recognize something that is negative in our life or something that happens to us that we perceive as negative turning into something positive. And getting stuck in the mud and turning that into, this, into a story is one of the best things that's ever happened to me. So I like to share that positive message with kids and people. Yeah, no, I love I, that. You know, uh, you know, it's something that's kind of close to my heart, too. I was injured in my adolescence. Um, I was four years old when I uh, was paralyzed. And it's uh, difficult being a child uh, with disability uh, just because other kids don't know a lot about disability. And there's not a lot of education surrounding it. So I was fortunate enough to have an amazing mom um, who, you know, helped like come into class and like educate my peers about my disability and, you know, like uh, to kind of normalize, you know, my wheelchair. And, you know, the fact that, um, you know, I would just do, be doing things a little bit differently. Um, so through my experience, I have had uh, several opportunities like in high school and after high school to um, go and speak to kids about um, disability and disability awareness and you know what it means to be disabled or you know um, how you know to like meet someone with a disability um, and so it's really super cool and amazing uh, to talk to you and to uh, see your art man and uh, your work um, to help contribute to that um, and help normalize it for kids and help educate them you know about like you said spitting the negativity and how it's generally portrayed and you know, media and life. 
Um, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's really amazing to see another positive example, um, you know, of it out there. Inspiring. That is one of my favorite things to do is to go to schools and do assembly presentations. And the last year has been especially tough because that hasn't been a possibility at the moment. And I just love going to schools because it really does change their perspective on what it means to have a disability and how you can still live your life with passion and yes. chase your dreams and being paralyzed doesn't have to stop you <clears throat> or whatever challenge people are facing. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I love being able to talk to kids. Yeah, well, kids, you know, are so unique in that there's like such a natural like kindness and like kindred curiosity, you know, that a kid has, um, you know, like I will like never, ever like shy away from like a kid that's like stuck on my wheelchair and like wants to come up and ask a bunch of questions about it and stuff. You know, like I love that curiosity and like I love that passion and, you know, that like uh, youth. I had an amazing opportunity pre-COVID to go and speak at a school that was doing a whole disability awareness week. Um, and right. they like uh, had me come and speak and talk about growing up and uh, with a disability. But afterwards they had like these stations where the kids could simulate a disability, like sit in a wheelchair um, right. and, you know, feel what it's like. And, you know, they set up like a little track and like the kids got to race each other. And like they had one for, you know, crutches and like, you know, blindfolds for, you know, simulate blindness and deafness and stuff. But it was a, it was amazing. I mean, it was magical to yeah. see again, like, you know, it almost like would make you a little bit afraid. Um, you know, how a kid might react, you know, like maybe be less sensitive. Are you afraid? Like may say something insensitive, but you know, that has never, ever been the case. You know, kids are so like naturally kind and curious. Um, it's a really, you know, beautiful and special thing uh, that I've been so grateful to be a part of um, a couple of times. So it's a, really cool to see you out there doing it too yeah tom one of the coolest things i got to do was go to a school with a shout out to the seattle slam that's right seattle slam and coach hannaford um but we went to a school and we set up a wheelchair rugby game with the kids they were we brought enough chairs so they could get in the chairs and we could go and smash around each other and obviously we didn't well, there was there was a couple of hits where some kids <laughs> kind of got taken out, but they were okay. Um, but it was really cool, and and it just opened up their eyes on the possibilities of what you can do and paralyzed. And th what I love about kids at that age is they're so you can impact them on such a greater scale at that young age. They're gonna they're gonna remember that stuff. They're gonna remember seeing someone overcoming their challenges and. I love that you're able to go out and talk to the kids too. Are you yeah. planning on doing more of that? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, like it's, I think, you know, the world's like starting to wake up again. Um, you know, definitely it's something on my, uh, on my list to continue to do, um, like potentially through like, uh, some live to roll action too. Like, uh, I want to get, uh, me and Sean out on the road to some schools. Yeah. And stuff. Sean uh, or Bobby, have you for sure. done any assembly presentations or talk to anybody at a school? Yeah. I'm, you know, I get, uh, I'm, uh, I don't know if you've do, uh, you've done it, uh, Toastmasters. So I've been doing Toastmasters okay. for, uh, yeah. for a long I, time. Bobby uh, is a Toastmaster, an award-winning Toastmaster. I just want to shout that out. I just picked up some, I think it's over my shoulder somewhere. I just picked up oh, some yeah. new hardware the other day. You know, I just you got some shirts. What's that? Are you a competent communicator, Bobby? I am a competent communicator. We're going to you know, out and talk Toastmasters. But Toastmasters, for real, is one of the best things I ever did because it gave me so much more confidence in my ability to, to speak. And now, because of Toastmasters, it, I, I'm a professional speaker. So, I, Yeah, I mean, we get, we get a lot of that, that come through through Toastmasters. And, you know, not all, not everyone that's there, a lot of times they're there for their the work just to give a presentation, but for anyone that just wants to go to schools and do that kind of work, one, it's just so rewarding, but two, it's just great to really tailor your speech style to your audience. And if your audience is going to be elementary to junior high, 
or I guess now it's called middle school to high school colleges. You, and, and you really, it's a, you're able to just put it down on paper and deliver it yeah. in a much yeah. better way. And so I always recommend it for anybody. And I was, I, I wish I would have done it when I was doing a lot of that assembly work and going back to my high school and all the schools in my area at that time. And now I just, I wish I can go back. I just, you know, with a job and working so much, it, it's kind of hard to do, but yeah, I, I'm glad you were able to do it. That was going to be my big question for you, Simon. And great to hear that you're doing that. It's funny you say that though, Bobby, because when I went and spoke to this uh, school over here in LA, um, that was, I found myself like, it was like a week before and I was writing out like my 15, 20 minute, you know, like speech I was going to give. And I was like, how am I going to communicate paralysis to a bunch of elementary school kids? Because they're not going to be able to like, you know, understand in just general layman's terms. Like, I'm going to need some way to make this real. So I found myself, I was like, man, I was a challenge. I was trying to go around like explaining disability to kids and stuff, like trying to get some resources. But um, I ended up, you know, just trying to like create some metaphors that I hope they can understand. And then asking some questions to um, get them to kind of like engage back with me and talk about it a little bit. But um, yeah, dude, definitely. Um, you gotta you gotta prepare for your audience. I'll we'll talk about that it's sometime, just... Tom, because definitely <clears throat> have some experience with being able to teach kids about spinal cord injuries, and the key is just multi media and different types of media. Having a having a, I I've created a video. I'll share that with you later, where I have an animation and I talk over it and. Help it, it. They just need that visual yeah. reference to help understand it. And uh, yeah, it's you know, you know, I found um, disability touches. I think almost everybody's life in some way, shape, or form. You know, whether it's yeah. their family member or friend, somewhere along the way. You know, like it's just you know part of our reality, and it's not always spinal cord injury. You know, it takes shape, and you know, as we all know, many different forms. But um, that's one of the things that was like very eye-opening to me was like the kids coming up to me asked afterwards you know talking about their grandparents um that are you know becoming like elderly and debilitated using a chair or you know they have a family member or a sibling who's in a chair and you know they come and start to talk to me about them and their experiences yeah. and you know how they experience their life and stuff but um that awareness and you know shaping disability is not like redefining the term you know, it's not something debilitating. It's not some, you know, it is something different, but, you know, I like this, the idea of just normalizing it, you know, uh, we're all, you know, different colors, you know, different flavors in the same pot, you know, and uh, yeah. I think it's a very important thing to install early on. And the thing that's the most amazing about it is like these kids are so flipping receptive um, to it. You know, when you're talking, you, like what they say back to you is really mind blowing and like eye opening too. Uh, yeah. which is very cool. Yeah. John, on that note, you asked me too, Simon. I actually yeah. haven't done any um, speaking at like kids. Uh, I've done yeah, American I, Career College. I has done it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one, so. Oh. Uh, uh, but, but, go ahead, Bobby. I, I was gonna ask uh, Simon, you know, you, you're one of your first children's stories where you know something you know that happened to you is that where you get a lot of your material from from your own life experience and put it in the book and kind of yeah. helps you and as well as your audience yeah i so i didn't know exactly what direction i was going when i created the first book i knew i wanted a series but as i started working on more and more content i thought you know what, I, I really do want to tell my own stories through my books. My second book is called Differently Awesome. And although the story isn't real, the the feeling of being treated differently or not being included or having someone just be mean to me because I use a wheelchair is very real. And it's about a game of kickball, but they don't want Frank to play because he uses a wheelchair. And they and so frank and mustard end up going and building their own team and challenging them and uh so it's the only story out of the four or five that i have that is more from the emotional experience but i have a, another 
couple of books, Wheels and Waves, which is about when I went surfing. Nice. And then Monster Trucking is about this really cool opportunity I had to drive a monster truck. And oh, you know what? When, what's that? Is that? I think I actually have a picture of you next to it. I don't know if it's the same one. You tell me. Uh, it's gonna, um, it'll drop. Yeah, it. yeah. No, that is the one. It's the one that's in the book. And uh, yeah, that's it right there. So I had this really cool experience and I was doing an event where I was selling my books and we were actually over in the tri cities, Eastern Washington. And I was like, I got to get a ride in that monster truck. And at the time I was making a lot of YouTube videos and I was like, I got to make this into a video. And I roll up there. It's before the event starts. There's no crowd. And I see one of the guys that is part of the monster truck crew. And I'm like, all right, so how are we getting me up there? And they were like, long story short, they came over and the, the owner, JB, Jeff Bainter, he used to drive Captain USA monster truck. And he said, well, I can actually do one better. I have purchased some hand controls and I've been waiting for this opportunity to let someone with a physical disability get in my monster truck and drive it. And he basically said, I want you to be the first one to do that. And we just had this instant connection. It was incredible. The whole team, like they got me in a forklift and lifted me up in my chair. And I was able to get in there and rally around the monster truck for a minute. It was awesome. And it just was the perfect story to tell the kids. That's Dude, cool. That, that is awesome, man. That's really cool. <clears throat> if you haven't had a chance to get a ride in a forklift, I highly re recommend it. Because I've been in a forklift, and it was actually pretty cool. Uh, it was on a farm. Uh, in the passenger or what? Uh, no, it was like uh, in a box, like on the forks. Uh, yeah. It was on my family's farm. And um, like my dad, uh, like we would like film wildlife and stuff. Uh, it's just like a hobby that we have. And uh, we took our cameras, and he set up a chair in a big pistachio nut box, we like um, uh, pistachio nut farmers. And there are these big container boxes for pistachios. They hold like a thousand pounds of pistachios. And we set up two chairs and we sat in there and my um, grandma lifted us up as high as it would go. It was like 20 feet up in the air. And we just chilled up there for a couple hours and um, you know, filmed some birds and just hung out um, oh, nice. and like took in the atmosphere. It was pretty cool. Yeah, when they lifted me up in the forklift, that was like the most adrenaline I'd had. Yeah, that yeah. was crazy. It was yeah, it was wild. But, uh, it was it was also awesome. Yeah, I think the closest I've come to that is uh, at the airport at Burbank Airport. There's no like tarm like there's no uh, like uh, whatever the um, you got to go out on the tarmac and there's like a ramp to get up. But the one of them didn't have a ramp, so they had like basically the scissor lift or whatever that that's the closest oh. i've ever got and i just lifted up like 20 so feet i'm kind of jealous oh. i haven't been on a forklift yet <laughs> dude i've yeah. been on some lifts like i don't know if you guys have ever been in these like outside like they're like these outdoor elevators oh yeah they like get you down in yeah. these tunnels and they're like these little boxy things and they are rusted and scary <laughs> and nasty and i i grew up in uh northern california near um Sonoma Speedway and we would go to the races every year multiple times a year uh, for the different events that would happen out there and I got stuck in this like oh elevator God. a couple of times like halfway down in this like dark tunnel oh, uh, oh man so yeah I don't know like always like assess the lift oh situation make sure the equipment looks trustworthy because it can be a little claustrophobic and scary getting stuck in something like that yeah, you know, the, funny, there's there's one. I don't know if you've been on it, Tom, but Pacific Amphitheater, I think, at uh, Universal, uh, they have they have one when you we had front row tickets to um, back in the day when it was um, oh god Jeff Foxworthy, and so to get down there, it was the tallest you know elevator, and it's you know glass or plastic, so you're going down. And everybody in the amphitheater can see you in this, you know, box. Just na 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 na, you know. And you're like, oh my god, you know. And everyone. And then I, I'm like, man, I have to go to the bathroom now. And it's in the middle of the concert. And you know, it's just. 
crazy. Oh yeah, dude. There's nothing worse. That's the like the the part about it is it, it's so slow. You're in the thing for like longer than you should be, and you're like, is this ever gonna get where it's going? Uh, awesome. I just want to say, hey, what's up, the jaw? Uh, they said, yeah, they recognize you. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't been making very many YouTube videos, but I'm still out doing lots of stuff. So. Appreciate yeah, that's it. You kind of transition into the more doing the books and stuff. Yeah, now. like I definitely did transition. Kind of, and one of the biggest reasons why I dropped off with my YouTube channel is because I wasn't I I injured my arms and I haven't been able to work out, and that was like kind of the core of my motivation for creating YouTube videos was oh. making workout videos, and I was doing a lot of different things. But when that dropped off, it was hard to be. Uh, yeah consistent with creating content yeah no that's understandable for sure and you kind of like I, it uh, kind of allowed you to find this your, your niche i feel like you know you kind of got like Definitely. a good thing I've, going i've got a really good thing going on and i poured uh, a lot of my time and energy and passion into it and i do miss making youtube videos but it's just i really love when i'm not behind a desk like when I'm doing the shows, I get to be at events and I'm seeing people and selling them my books directly. I just love that kind of interaction with people where I'm not sitting behind a computer. So I got some questions though about sitting behind a computer. Um, yep. When it comes to creating the book and, you know, writing and, you know, like building the book and, you know, like putting it all together, uh, like how do you do it? Do you use software? Uh, like do, do it all on a computer? So with the writing, I usually use a, a Google document, uh -huh. save it on the cloud, yeah. and I just work on it in the car. Or not so much anymore because I'm driving, but I usually just use that, and that way I can use voice. Or got it anywhere, me. yeah. And I always have it ready to go when I'm ready. But really, I spend about 1% of my time working on the books. 99% is marketing and I, uh, that's where I spend most of my time, but yeah. And the illustrator uses Adobe Photoshop and yeah, we work on it together a lot when we're working on the books, but he's actually focusing more on his pottery career. He's a fantastic teapot maker. His name's Arturo Alvarez and, uh, if you get a chance, you should look him up. Yeah, yeah, the uh, main reason I ask is because uh, that's kind of my world is computers. Like, I love computers, and I'm always curious how other uh, quads, especially, um, but you know, with disabilities, um, uses their computer and interacts with it. Uh, like, I see you got the little uh, uh, devices on your hands. Is that for your keyboard? Yeah, this is, these are universal for me, where I, these are universal handcuffs, and we, I put a pen in here, and my mom actually helped me come up with these when I was first injured. And I really wanted to play video games. 19 video games were my life before that. Yeah. And Halo and stuff like that. Hell yeah. And, totally, totally. Yeah. Good old Halo days. And yeah. I couldn't play. And it was really frustrating and made me upset with my condition. And she was like, all right, hold on, hold on. Let's see what we can do. She pulled out these hand straps. She gave me a pencil. And we started modifying the controller. And before I knew it, I had a mouthpiece and I could press all the buttons. And these have been so influential in my life for just making my hands more accessible. Now that I'm driving, though, I do use them less because I can't have anything on my hands when I put my hands into the hand, uh, hand control on both the steering wheel and the gas and brake, yeah. which uh, I'm learning to live without them as much. But keyboard video games i'm definitely using these so can you not get those on on your own then you need help you need like a caregiver or something no, i can i can take them on and off oh you can't take them on and off okay cool i was just wondering if that's why you weren't using them like after the car or anything but uh, it's what the challenging part is where to put them and are uh can i grab them without dropping them and i just lately since i'm only been driving since february it's something new for me and i usually keep one in my side pouch but i've found i don't really need them as much when i'm on the road i'm not doing anything usually that 
requires fine dexterity. Um, so Simon, I gotta ask, bro. Now that you open Pandora's box, um, all right. What video games are you video playing games. these days, dude? I mostly play League of Legends. All right, that's dude, that's cool. Yeah, I, I love the, I love the competitive team strategy, and I've just been playing it more for fun. I used to do a lot of ranked, but I, uh, I've also met some other friends who have quadriplegia and we played online and so there's a connection there as well yeah it's just a game that i can play relatively well with my disability and it just works out really well like playing a shoot up game like call of duty or something like that i'm that i don't have it figured out yeah. where i can play it well and i don't want to play a game that my disability really inhibits my ability to play so yeah, my yeah. biggest uh, MMO I probably played was like StarCraft and like StarCraft Two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like I like those a lot, just because it was a more about strategy. Like, uh, yeah. like you feel know, like like high like actions per minute. You know, like good at, like hand activity uh, that would help you. But you could also strategize and not be too quick on the keys. Quick in be StarCraft. Right. When I watch the professionals, they're just all over the map and yeah. You have to- do like 30 tasks at the same time yeah but it's a lot in your head which i don't know i kind of like that like logic part um but in any event i think he is a starcraft or he was a starcraft professional player i think his name's specter he's got some youtube videos uh Uh, yeah possibly i haven't really been on the on the scene in a couple years i don't think he's been on the scene for a while but yeah yeah. it's cool to see professional gamers out there that have the same challenges that we do yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, I've been playing video games ever since I was a kid, and I've been disabled since I was a kid. So I was always just like learning to compete with my brother. Um, what like, are you playing now? Uh, I've just been on like a lot of the big like AAA games. Like, I've been really into Red Dead Redemption Two lately, oh, yeah. and I just I finished up Cyberpunk, which was fun. Um, and then um, I got a Switch um, for Christmas this last year, and y'all do nintendo is back in my life baby like yeah, super right. mario 3d world yeah, like nintendo. smash bros with the homies dude like uh, like mario kart like all day I'm mario dude. kart in my life man i and i just i don't i don't i need to see more uh setups from other people who have quadriplegia i can I play can. mario kart on the little joy con but i'll tell you what man like it is a trick like um me and sean gotta make a video on it because um like i can do it really well um but I usually like the controller. Like I can just play on a regular Xbox controller, like uh, PlayStation controller. It doesn't matter. Uh, like I can do them all pretty well. Uh, yeah. And I just do it with my hands. Um, but it's like what you said. I love RPGs because I'm in my world. Like I can just do my thing. It's not a lot of pressure. Like if I'm playing online, like Call of Duty or something, like it, it is a lot of hand stuff and it's very technical. And I just, it's not really my thing. Um, yeah. you know, like the really intense online gameplay. I'd rather yeah. kind of just chill out and, you know, like do fun stuff. I, I remember one year I was playing like Halo 2 or something like that. And I saw this guy on YouTube who was, who was really good. And I actually reached out to him. He ended up coming on and playing with me. And I was like, oh, I'm probably going to work this dude. And dude, he worked the whole server and just was killing people left and right. The dude had, he was on another level and his hands were paralyzed i was just shocked at how good he was was that's something that i've been thinking about starting is like a channel or like a group where it's like a bunch of disabled gamers get together and like play and talk about video games and like talk about how they play together um so yo dude shout out anyone in the chat if you're interested in like playing like some switch online or uh, something else let me know i got a bunch of different stuff and uh, i'm down to like uh start playing with some other disabled gamers and uh maybe recording some of the gameplay um, but I need some. I need some other cool crips out there who get to like playing some league. Yeah, dude. I'm well, down. you know, Sean, we have the women's group, so it sounds like you're gonna have to come up and uh, put Tom in control of making gamer live to roll and you know, have their own corner every month and do you like do you like a show? Oh, we got some <laughs> ideas, people. It's happening over here. Let's roll. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can we, Sean, and, Sean and I are over here like. Uh, what? Yeah. Uh, I remember Asteroids. Was that a, that that was a, that's my game. So, 
Oh, I got I played Mario Kart and stuff with like with these guys when I was younger, but what? I didn't transition when I got injured. I wasn't that into yeah. gaming to play. You know, like the OG, like Super Mario, like you guys played that. Yeah, I'm play, sure. Like, like they yeah, just released a yeah, new version guys. of that. It's a little yeah. different now, but it's kind of the same. What about some Contra, dude? Up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, AB. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Damn, Sean. Yeah. Like, OG over so here. Hey, can we shout yeah. out uh, Ben real quick? Yeah, yeah I, um, I wanted to do that. Because he uh, donated $10 to the channel. Um, you're so awesome, man. Uh, very cool. Um, and... I don't uh, mind uh, if we can get back to the book a little, Simon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean well, for that segue, you guys. My bad. That's all right. No, no, no. It's Tom, just all your fault, buddy. I had a couple questions. I mean, I, I'm to be honest, I just don't have the book, and I'm gonna get it uh, today. And so I just wanted to know, like, how many pages are your books? And my second question is. Uh, when you're working with your illustrator, what is that like and back and forth with him? Yeah, well, the thing about when I started my children's books with my buddy Art, we didn't know what we were doing, and but we, we believed in it. We believed in the process. We knew that we could create something that people would want to read. Now, I didn't know any of the rules quote unquote that are typically there for children's books like most children's books are 32 pages now my first book is 56 pages it's pretty long but it's been really successful and i didn't have those rules to follow when i was just getting started i'm an independent author i was making all the decisions with arturo we were creating it as we went. And I really just felt like I wanted to tell the story. And the story ended up being 56 pages for the first one. Now, I decided with the second book and all the books after that to get it down to 45 pages to tighten up the story a little bit more and make every page matter a little bit more. And that's one of the big things with making children's books. You really have to make every page matter. Now, after that, we just started working on it and we just evolved our process and got better and better at it. And, but I've kept with the 45 page deal for the Frank and mustard series. I'm looking at branching out and creating a new book series, maybe not a book series, but a one-off as well. Right on. That's cool. Do you have any more specific questions about it, Bobby? Uh, I'll, I'll <clears throat> Oh, no, I just, about the, go ahead, Bob. Oh, I, I'm sorry, it, the mute was on. Uh, more of my question is like, so when you guys sit down with the idea, how long does it take to write one of those books if it is 30 pages or 50 pages? Stuck in the Mud took a year to make, but we were, we were going, we were doing it for the first time. So there were a lot of challenges like, we had to redo a few different things, but Photoshop makes it really nice where we can change things really easily. When we got around to the second and third book, the time that it took was more like six to eight months. So we could get it down there and be pretty efficient with it. Once we got into a routine with each other and when creating the books, I definitely had been pretty active in directing it. I'm like the director of the children's book and we have just gone through that and done it that way because I I just am very passionate about the story and it's a story from my life. So I was working heavily with art to create the series together. Nice. I wanted to ask you the question about, you said you basically did it on all on your own. So who did, did you basically publish it yourself? Did you just take self yeah. I, nice. I ended up going with an independent publisher. My mom, funny enough, actually brought home a book from her hairdresser. They had gone through this local Northwest publisher. The book called quality was great. I ended up contacting her. It was a better price than I could find anywhere else. And it's a product I knew I could trust. 
I ended up going with that, and I'm really happy with it. Shout out to the Book Publishers North uh, Network. They were super amazing to get started with and just give me some direction when I just had so many questions that I didn't have answers to at the time. Nice, man. That's cool, yeah. Yeah. I was curious about that. Were you and, and so I, I don't know where this question lies. Like, is it like full time? Are you doing this, you know, at the computer, not saying eight hours a day, but is it pretty much like a full time job or kind of a part time hobby? What is it? What is it? Where do you put it in your life? Definitely a full time job. I before COVID, my life looked like this. I was working an event every weekend going to a different location. I might be in Seattle one week. I might be in the Bay Area next. I was going to schools in the meantime as well. And everything was focused around getting my book out there, sharing my positive message about disability awareness and, and positive mindset. The, so it, it's taken up my whole life. And actually, since COVID, I am working on rebalancing my life. I was doing a lot of work previously before COVID hit, which didn't leave me very much room for connection, with, emotional connection with people in my life. My connections with people were very shallow because I'd be in a different place every weekend. And that had felt like something missing from my life. When COVID hit, it slowed everything down and it helped me realize that I do want to prioritize that more. So in the future, my plan is to stick more locally to the events, do more farmers markets. But in June, or I mean, actually this month and July, and after that, I will be, I'm going to be doing farmers markets five days a week. I'll start doing schools in the next school year. And it's a full-time job. I'm When I'm working hard and when things are going, I'm working at least a hundred hours a week. So sounds like it's a lot of, a lot of traveling then, huh? Yeah. And I love that part. I love being able to travel because I've been able to go down to the Bay area and, and I don't have to pay anything out of pocket because the business is or has been successful enough where it pays for all my expenses. I get to go on a trip, see something new and do something new as well as get my books out into a new area. So I, I I love that part of the job where I get to travel, but it's at a sacrifice where I don't get to connect as much with people in my area. All right, bro. Inspire me, man. Uh, traveling's a big topic um, for myself, um, and I think for a lot of people. Um, so it's like kind of something I'm really looking to venture into and do more independently. Um, and... So tell me, man, how do you do it? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, have to have someone to go with me. I can't do the events without someone there to go with me. So I require a caregiver to come to the shows and it's pretty straightforward. I book event or I book hotels in advance and I try to find hotels and stuff that are going to be well suited for my wheelchair, but 50% of the time, I don't get it right. The The hotel isn't very accessible. The hotel doesn't get it right. And it can be a challenge, but not a big enough challenge to stop me from being able to do it. Yeah. The other part is just, it, it is a lot of work. And I, in the past, I've used one person to do a lot of that work. Whereas now that I'm doing farmer's markets, I'm spreading that work out with other caregivers and being able to not put all the pressure on one caregiver because it will start to break them down quite literally with their bodies and stuff like that. And that's not what I want to do with my caregivers. So it's really nice to be thinking locally, doing more farmer's markets and having more people to be on my team to help me accomplish my goal. Nice, man. 
Yeah, that's cool, dude. That's that's good. You got to figure it out because that's hard, dude. The travel is tough, uh, and having help all the time and working yeah. that out and stuff. It has to be really well coordinated and organized, and having a supportive team member that's willing to put in the grunt work, especially if I'm going to California or something like that. Yes, for work. But I big shout out to Dijon Mustard, my old caregiver Casey not able to work for me anymore but guy put in a lot of work for me and just wanted to see the best for me that guy sold more books than i did half the time he was always telling everybody about my frank and mustard stuff so that's shout cool. out to mustard yeah that's cool when you got somebody that supports like that yeah you know i uh, i've done a couple like uh independent stays in like hotels now and stuff and i've like been really working on it and that's what i found is like the um the details are really in your preparation, you know, like that's like your, your success is like how well prepared you are, you know, like I can almost set myself up to be prepared for, you know, almost anything. Um, yeah. And I just got to like have, you know, have my stuff uh, with me and, you know, like have a decent accommodation, you know, meaning like no hotel bed has to at least, you know, be a certain like height for my chair and stuff. Um but yeah, man, it's just like working on the finer details and being able to adapt to change when things are a little off. Um, yeah. You know, that's kind of yeah, the... You've got you to be ready to uh, roll, that's for sure. I am actually going to Wenatchee this weekend, which is central Washington or eastern Washington. Uh -huh. And uh, it's my first event since COVID hit. And oh, wow. I'm really excited to just get out of town. I'm going to be there for four and a half days and doing my event doing what i love and there's more sunshine there right now too which is something i'm really looking forward to awesome there you go uh where is it that you're uh from simon i'm from the seattle area yeah, okay i forgot to mention that i'm in olympia which if y'all didn't know is the capital of washington state nice and is it rainy up there it is quite rainy but the summers are absolutely beautiful. And as much as the winters are difficult, the summers are just incredible. Yeah, so it looks like you're in a, are you in a power chair or manual chair most of the time? Yeah, I'm in a power chair. Okay. I'm in a quickie three something, three, six, five or something. I don't know. All right, all right. One of those series. What, so with your power chair, as a power chair user and in the rain, quite often in the winter time, what's the maintenance? What's the care? How do you, do you just avoid it? What's how do you your strategy? Get stuck in the mud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I get stuck in the mud, you probably get an idea that I, the rain never stops me from, from going and doing what I want. I do have to be a little bit careful, but I've never even really given it that much thought as far as like protecting my joystick or anything like that. It seems to be fine the way it is. I haven't had any problems with this chair. It's been a really nice chair for me. And um, yeah, I'm still able to go out and do what I want, especially now that I'm driving, I'm gonna be able to go out. But you know, during the winter, I do like to be at home more, probably playing more video games or, but I do, even though I'm doing a lot of shows still, I don't necessarily go out into nature which is something that i really enjoy doing yeah i do want to show you guys something though there's a tool i don't know if any of you have seen this but it's the cripper yeah. and uh, from quadtools.com they are really good people over there and this is one of the tools that helps me be more independent and i just slide my hand in here and you do it right you can get it really nice and tight to your hand and uh, shove it on there like that and then oh your tenodesis grabs it yeah, yeah. tenodesis is key but they also have a they also have a sip and puff one so oh wow it's really awesome oh. i can pick up the smallest thing on the ground with it I can grab my cell phone if it drops, if my hand straps drop, it's really nice. And anybody that has quadriplegia, this makes it feel like you have your hands back. 
and they have different ranges of them. You can have a shorter one, or they have like one where you can have a knife attached to it. Yeah, it's yeah. really like, pretty awesome. There's, there's one I'm, a, I'm there's one I want to order that has tongs. So I love oh, the nice. barbecue. Yeah. And, yeah, the, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, usually barbecue and quads <laughs> don't mix, but um, <laughs> but it's awesome to see them. Do you that. keep that on your chair all the time? So you have that with I you? I don't have it on my chair. I was just on the side. I usually oh, okay. just keep it in my room where it's accessible to me and I can grab it when I need it. I don't take it out. If I had one of the shorter ones, I probably I might do that, but it's just really useful for being at home. I don't uh, want to toot my own horn too much, but um, I'm a pro grabber user. And um, yeah. I, I'm i a big fan of grabbers all around, any kind, any yeah. variety especially the quad tools. It's funny, I knew this cool cat uh, back in my junior college days in Northern California, which is also a very wet place, by the way. We would get like 40, 50 inches of rain a year, and it was oh, soggy um, in the power chair for sure. But he had one of those like five years ago. It was a long time ago. He paid like 150 bucks out of pocket for it. I was like, yo, wow. man, you're crazy. They're a little pricey. Um, but yeah. it, he had the team to do this really well. 150 is expensive for these things? These are life changers. Uh, well, well no, it just like, felt like a big number at the time. And then I moved out and spent $3,000 on a shower chair out of pocket. Oh so God. that changed real quick yeah. um, so for I, sure. I actually got Area Agency on Aging, which is my caregiving agency, to buy one for me. And uh, because it helps us be more independent. Nice. I just don't tell your agency how independent you are because <laughs> you want to keep as many hours as you can. Yeah. yeah, the one that I got, um, I really needed a tub slide shower chair. Like, I live in an apartment here in LA, and um, the bathrooms, like, I needed something that could adapt to a tub. And we found this thing, it was just a shower chair um, that, uh, like, could sit over the toilet, but then it attaches to a bracket that slides over in the tub. The same chair that I'm sitting in with armrests and everything. And um, it was invented by a quadriplegic out of the Midwest, and it's called a tub slide shower chair. If anybody wants okay. the details, slide yeah, in the DMs, that. Uh, let me know. But it was not covered by insurance. And it was, like I just said, it was th like $3,000 um, that like my parents forked out out of pocket for me to be like semi-independent in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, at least make showering easier with my caregivers. Um, but yeah, the stuff isn't cheap, any of it. Um, no. But uh, no, I got a script and like uh, some stuff I done for a... Uh, um video on grabbers i might need uh you to record yourself using that bad boy um so yeah, john can uh add it in yeah tom's one of the only people i know or quads i know that uses like regular grabbers he can just like yeah get his oh, hand yeah. in there and really do you can it. use a regular grabber yeah, yeah he uses the regular ones just with two hands or even like in his elbow almost it's crazy it's, it's, and i can get it's impressive i can get anything really up if you uh give yeah. me enough time uh, I can yeah. usually do pretty well. Um, I don't know. I kind of like take it as a challenge. Um, like I can get stuff up off the ground too, like from my power chair, and just like hanging and like leaning over out of my chair. It, right it is like scares the shit out of anybody that's watching. You don't have keno pieces, right? Uh, no, I do uh, in my uh, left hand really well. Okay. Um, nice. And then my right, right. is, so it's funny. My right arm is stronger, but the hand function is really bad. But okay. my... Left arm is weaker, but my hand functions a lot stronger. Do you work out, Tom? Uh, um, I used to go to the gym a couple of days a week, um, but I haven't since uh, like school and COVID stopped. You gotta get on my TikTok, bro. Um, yeah. I, dude, I, I'm not a big fan of TikTok for reasons, um, but I will get on your exercise game. Um, I do a lot. I mean, I do. I mean, just like you do, probably, man. Um, independent living is like very physical doing all your transfers and stuff on your own you I know i don't like, do any transfers so okay I, my, my triceps aren't functional so I, I yeah i mean neither neither are mine uh i can't like put my arm up above my head like that's it um oh, yeah. i can i can toss it um but um i do do all my transfers independently just wow. use my shoulders and my back and shift to my weight um okay and that and i think i mean maybe i have a little bit of tricep that gives me the edge that i need um okay. your trans I, if anybody's curious tom's transfer is up on the channel you can see it. it's in the transfers playlist 
Uh, yeah, I do have this transfer. Up. But I don't know, man. Like sometimes I get in and out of my chair throughout the day, like doing all my transfers and stuff. Like on my days I don't have care, dressing myself and I, like doing that. So like it's very physical. Like I feel like it's a workout. Like after I'm done, um, oh, you know, yeah. like my arms are well, like I mean, kind of worked. You look kind um, of jacked. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> uh, that's called the extra large shirt, so he looks good. <laughs> Damn, Bobby bird. over here, come oh, me out, bro. You don't know my shoulder game, Bobby. I'm about to take this shirt off. Uh, anybody, like, be careful. I might get a little um, ready to do. Oh, you look great. No, nah, just you. kidding. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I, I do you have something with workout videos? I think you said something. I or... have some old YouTube workout videos. What I'm doing now is I'm on TikTok is the Alpha Squad and I am oh, on there and I am I'm I'm just doing like one minute motivational videos where I'm just I'm just putting in the work and I want to share my progress. I'm kind of getting back to what I did on YouTube with sharing those videos and really TikTok's great because I can pass it to Instagram and Facebook really easily and it just is I love that I don't have to spend any time editing. I just pop out a one minute video and hopefully over time people will, will be more and more inspired by what I'm doing. And I'm just, I'm just awesome. telling it like it is and telling people to get in the gym and get it done. And I'm doing the same after a, a, a long hiatus of not being able to work out. It feels incredible to have it be back in my life. Alpha, yeah. Alpha, I'll, I'll make sure to text me that after and I'll get it in the description. Okay. So I'll make sure. You know, yeah, because... dude, we want to we want to link the TikTok. We'll definitely link the Frank and Mustard stuff too. Um, yeah. You know, like go and uh, follow Simon. Um, you know, stay up on all his uh, updates, all the new books, and you know, all his yeah, you know, workout uh, motivational stuff coming out. Definitely. What were you saying, my, Bobby? Sorry, my, my TikTok is oh, no. or Instagram, uh, the Alpha Quad for TikTok. Instagram is just my name, Simon Calcabecchia. I know you're gonna have to look that up. But I, we, I have, we got it on the screen. Yeah, I have it on screen and in the description. So yeah. and I have the Frank and Mustard uh, Instagram in there as well. That was cool. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what I was gonna say is everybody thinks they need a gym to go to and get a workout when yeah. really I mean it's right here. It's at your fingertips on at home. Maybe just getting. Yeah, it is hard to do it on your own, but if you're watching someone like you. Uh, YouTube or now, you know, with the pandemic, now there's online fitness centers and it, you don't have to go anywhere. And it's, that's, it's really kicked my butt here in 2020 that once I finally just said, duh, I don't have to go find a dumb gym. I can get fit right here. And yeah. it, it, you know, it's just so inspiring to me now that I just want to inspire everybody that they can get fit at home. It's easy to Definitely. do. Yeah, Bobby, I'm, I'm you're, you're in better that. shape than I think you've been in years, huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, it took a pandemic that said, you know, nobody was doing anything. I'm like, well, that ain't right because I'm going to do something here and got back into, you know, my high core fitness. I mean, it just this weekend I did a 10 mile push. I probably pushed 20 <laughs> miles since Friday. So, I mean, it just just been feeling great again and you know i do want to um do a big shout out especially any quads any pairs like anybody out there um getting back and recovering you know like um, adls are a big form of exercise and when i say adls i mean just activities of daily living stuff like transferring getting out of your chair getting onto a couch and move around you know have your family and put you on the floor and you know wrestle around roll around i used to just go get in the pool you know move my body around you know even if it wasn't swimming laps or anything all of that stuff is super helpful for circulation. If you start working on your independent transfers and things like that, like uh, you'd be amazed at how you feel your muscles and your muscles in your body change. And it benefits a lot of different elements in your life. So it's easy to work out at home, but it's also easy to just, you know, do some simple things in your life too, um, you know, that are very possible. Um, you know, a lot of people are just a little too lazy to do it sometimes. So. Um, uh, yeah, if you uh, if you feel the inspiration, uh, push yourself a little bit and uh, see what you can do. And it's also motivation. I it's you know sometimes it's hard for us to get motivated. It's you know uh, somebody who was on here earlier, Paul. You know, without my buddy Paul now, who I've never met, lives in Canada, and 
you know, him and I work out. It's it's great to have a workout partner. When he's not around, it's like, mm, yeah, I should do it. You know, so it's always easier. But I also find if he's not around, I get on YouTube and find some form of exercise video and they're out there nowadays. And you just got to you got to use the right keywords to put it into YouTube or online and you can find those workout videos. Hey, I would like to just uh, give a little thank you for the compliments I meant on my guns. I'm going to wear a tank top next week just so Great. Bobby can't say nothing. Yeah. And I'm going to arm wrestle you on the show, bro. It's happening, <laughs> dog. Um, on, we'll, 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 we'll see. We'll see who's got it. Come on. Let's, let's come to this studio. It's, it's finally looking nice, but come on. All right. All right, Bobby. I've been waiting to come and see your house in the OC, bro. Mm -hmm. I'd rather watch that than uh, Mayweather. Well, actually, that's not true. <laughs> no, I, I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah, let's not bring attention to that. <laughs> and uh, hey, shout out to Base, who I just saw left a comment. Hey, if you're on TikTok, the Alpha Quad, I'm I'm getting in the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I'm sure Bobby is as well. I don't know about Sean and Tom, but uh, they're doing the ADLs. I'm work No, I actually have started working out again. Just just a little bit because Bobby keeps sending me his push times telling me he's going to beat me in the 5k for triumphs uh, 5k this year. So, so now I'm like, all right, fine. I'm going to start training too, Bobby. Hey, I got my manual chair coming out of the shop too. Like me, I'm going to hop in my manual. I'm going to start getting on my fat 5k game. You guys, I'm not even going to tell you guys, it's just going to have, I'm going to beat you. Like you're not even going to see it coming. Let's go, let's go. Let's, All right, Bobby. I love, I love it, man. I love the, I love the fire. <laughs> oh yeah, that's awesome, guys. Uh, well, um, so just we'll start to wrap up here, guys. But because I know Simon's got some prior engagements as well to get to, yeah. but just make sure to follow him on Instagram and on his TikTok, Alpha Quad. I'll get that in the description. Um, his website is also there for the books if you want to check out books. Um, Frankenmonster.com. Yep. Yep, easy enough to get to. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again, Simon, for coming out and hanging out yeah. with us. Thanks Shannon. for having me. I've been, uh, been wondering when I was going to get asked that question, um, but, I, but I've been very patient. You've had some great guests and uh, happy to be a part of it now. For sure, man. Sorry it took so long to get you on here, man. <laughs> um, but yo, Simon, I will be bringing you back, man, to talk about some other quad topics. Yeah, man. Because uh, you seem like a really awesome guy. He's like very knowledgeable about a lot of different aspects of this life, dude. So uh, we'll definitely be asking you back, man, um, soon. And, uh, you know, just want to say thanks to everybody watching. Um, you know, make sure to smash that like button if you haven't. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, uh, please do. It, uh, you know, really helps out the channel. And uh, thanks for everybody that comments and, uh, you know, as a part of this every week, you guys are the best. And shout out to Ben, number one fan again uh, with that uh, super chat donation. <laughs> yeah, man, Ben, we wrote, really appreciate the love, dude. And uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. We're though. doing we, a lot we, of we stuff to guys. work on Live to Roll right now. And uh, we really appreciate the love uh, to, you know, help make it uh, bigger and better. So thanks, you guys. Yeah, thanks everybody. Also, if you guys, you in the chat uh, have topic ideas, send it to us on the in our Instagram, Live to Roll. Uh, let us know what you want, and we're going to try to put it together for you guys. Make sure to share that Live to Roll Instagram. We're trying to get it going. And, yeah, uh, yeah lots of love, everybody. All right, everybody. Yeah, thanks for having See you guys me. next week. Thanks, Simon. All right.